Great. Welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar. We're very um, thankful to uh, our team from Ontario Health who will introduce themselves shortly. Um, but of course, I will start with a, a land acknowledgement. It's really important even in these virtual times that we acknowledge the land. And I know we're all joining from different parts of the province today and maybe different parts of the, the country even. Um, but I'm gonna speak about the land upon which um, the CPSO offices sit, which is 80 College Street in what is now known as Toronto. Um, and importantly, I think, as with any land acknowledgement, we need to think about what does acknowledging the land actually compel us to do? What is the action item towards reconciliation that we are thinking about and actioning when we acknowledge the land? So this is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Um, it's covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And as I said, while acknowledging the land is very welcome, it really is only a small part of cultivating strong relationships with First Peoples of Canada. Acknowledging um, territory has to take place within uh, the larger context of genuine and continued understanding towards uh, reconciliation. We know that the legacies of colonialism are not just historic. We know that continued, continued colonial oppression uh, happens today uh, and manifests in many different ways, including differential healthcare outcome. I also just want to uh, recognize, uh, particularly given today's topic, that while many people of African descent may have come here by choice, many have actually come here as a result of histor historical force and the legacies of enslavement. And it's important for us to think about that uh, while we acknowledge the land and in terms of the topic today. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand it over to um, the team to introduce themselves and to move us into today's presentation. I would like to also just say that Dr. Mary Mano, my colleague, was going to present a little bit about the general quality improvement program at CPSO. Unfortunately, she's not able to join us today, but I will let you know that previous webinars where she has spoken about that are recorded and available and Rachel can put those links into the chat so that you can go and find out more generic information about the quality improvement program uh, through those resources. Okay, I'll hand it over now to Madeline. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharda. Um, and it's my pleasure to be uh, here with Dr. Sharda, with the CPSO team, uh, and with our co-presenters today so that we can share with you the work that has gone into this quality standard for sickle cell disease uh, in Ontario. Next slide, please. And we'll bring up the next slide. So I'm going to start by giving you a, an overview uh, of who our presenters will be. It'll just be on the next slide, some pictures um, and information. We have Ms. Lanri Tunji Ajayi, who's the president and CEO of the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario and part has been a participant in the Quality Standards Advisory Council as a lived experience advisor. Uh, we have Karen Fleming, who also participated in the QSOC as a member, as a healthcare worker. She's a clinical nurse specialist in the Red Blood Cell Disorders Program, University Health Network. We have Sinthu Srikanthan, who is a, also a member of QSOC and works as a social worker in the Red Blood Cell Disorders Program at University Health Network. Uh, myself, I'm a hematologist at St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton and Hamilton Health Sciences. Uh, and we have Carol Kennedy as well, who is the lead of Clinical and Quality Standards Ontario Health. And this represents just a small sampling of the huge uh, number of people, both from Ontario Health and from the Quality Standards Advisory Council who work to uh, bring this initiative to fruition. Next slide, please. So uh, each of our presenters today will be starting by providing our disclosures. Uh, my main disclosure is that I serve as a consultant to Vertex Pharmaceuticals on the Endpoint Adjudication Committee, and I won't be speaking today, not, we won't be speaking today about anything that uh, relates to Vertex. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Lanre to share her disclosures. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lanre Twinji Jai. And in terms of disclosure, 
Um, I do serve on Roche and Overseas uh, Advisory Board as a consultant, and I do receive honorarium based on that. However, what we are discussing today, I do not have any correlation with that. I also am a member on the Opioids and Youth Advisory Board, and uh, that there's no other financial disclosure for me at this time. Thank you. Great. So we'll keep on bringing up uh, slides as our presenters have an opportunity to share. For Karen. Hi. Thank you. My name is Karen Fleming, and I have no disclosures to share. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sindhu Shrikanthan, and I also have no disclosures to share. And hi, my name is Carol Kennedy, and I have no disclosures to share. Next slide. As well, uh, I'd just like to mention that the Quality Standards Program received in-kind support from Ontario Health to develop the sickle cell disease quality standards. Next slide, and I'll pass it over to Madeline. Uh, thank you, Carol. And so with with all of that background in mind, uh, our, our learning objectives for today. So we uh, will be, by the end of this presentation, uh, be able to explain why a quality standard of sickle cell disease is needed and understand how to provide equitable, anti-racist, high quality care in Ontario to this population of patients. Number two, to identify opportunities to implement the quality statements to improve care for people with sickle cell disease and for their family and caregivers. And third, describe and know how to use the available tools and resources to improve the quality of care for people with sickle cell disease. And uh, we'll bring up the next slide and I'm going to pass it over to Lan Ray. Thank you so much, Madeline. And I really hope that our participation in this quality standard um, improvement webinar would truly help to change the status quo uh, as we call all to action. Next slide. I would like to share two experiences of people with sickle cell disease. Um, the first family lives outside of the Greater Toronto. Um, area and one afternoon, they rushed their daughter with sickle cell disease who was experiencing Hackett's chest syndrome to the local hospital. Uh, from their from their um, recollection, it was a nightmare of an experience and one that they cannot forget in a hurry. They felt that the staff um, showed no urgency to treat their daughter, and it actually seems that the staff did not understand the complications that could result from untimely treatment of acute chest syndrome. So as the young lady's condition deteriorated, the hospital staff then realized that they did not have the resources or skills to treat her, and they eventually had to transport her with via an ambulance to an hospital in Toronto. Similarly, there's a male, 50 plus, who reported that he went to his local hospital for pain crisis and he was made to wait for almost 10 hours. Despite screaming of excruciating pain, he was told that, well, um, you have other, that, that there are other people ahead of you, you can jump the queue and so on and so forth. And when he was finally attended to, and he told them that he usually take morphine for pain, he said he was asked point blank if he was seeking drugs. Now, in the first quarter of this year, we have lost three people to preventable sickle cell disease complications and two of them in their 20s. Currently, the quality of sickle cell disease care that you will receive in Ontario is directly linked to where you live, the hospital you go to, and the healthcare providers that attend to you. Many sickle cell disease patients are left for hours in emergency department, all the way in agonizing pain without appropriate analgesia. And when seen, they may be stigmatized, labeled as drug seeking, and denied access to effective pain medication. I say anti black racism, systemic racism limited knowledge of and the unwillingness to learn a disease 
that some have passed a minority disease are part of the factors contributing to the continued delivery of suboptimal care when it comes to, this, to sickle cell disease, and this must stop. Ontario Health has developed the quality standards for sickle cell disease, and I say it is the duty of every healthcare provider in this country to follow the recommendations provided in the quality standards. So we call you to action today to not only know the quality standard for sickle cell, but to share it with your colleagues. No one should die because somebody else is providing suboptimal care. Thank you. Next slide. Thanks so much, uh, Laure, for your ongoing advocacy and raising awareness uh, across the province and nationally and internationally on this really, really important topic. And I'm going to start today's session with a little bit of background on the quality standards. Um, quality standards inform clinicians and patients what quality care looks like. They're a small set of high impact statements that describe optimal care where identified quality gaps exist in Ontario. So our quality standards are designed to raise the ceiling with the goal of having the best possible care to all Ontarians, regardless of where you live in the province. They're grounded in the best available evidence and we use clinical practice guidelines combined with lived experience to develop the quality standard with an advisory committee. Next slide, please. So in January, Ontario Health released a quality standard for sickle cell disease. It's accompanied by an assortment of resources, including a patient guide, a clinical placemat, and a measurement guide, as well as a generic getting started guide to help healthcare providers and organizations put the standard into practice. And we'll be highlighting some of that today. Um, as we work through where there's hyperlinks, as we work through the presentation, we'll be putting those hyperlinks in the chat box as well. There's a QR code where you can access those links. Next slide. So first, I'd like to acknowledge the Sickle Cell Disease Quality Standard Advisory Committee members that are listed on this slide. Next slide. Uh, thank you. And uh, you can learn more about the committee through the QR code and the link that will be provided. So I mentioned earlier, we have a getting started guide is a general tool that can be used to support implementation of any of our quality standards. This guide outlines a process for using quality standards as a resource to deliver high quality care. It includes templates, tools, stories and advice from healthcare professionals, patients and caregivers. So you can use this lot guide and learn about evidence-based approaches to implementing changes to your practice. Next slide. Within the, the getting started guide is an action planning template, which is a tool to help your implementation planning. It will help you prepare a plan for implementing changes to practice, that align with the care described in the quality standard. It can help you assess your current practice, identify barriers and facilitators to change, record interventions and track progress. So you can download this guide to help you and your teams. Next slide. I'll pass it over to Madeline. Thank you very much, Carol. So uh, it'll be my pleasure now to provide some further background about why, why is it that we need a quality standard for sickle cell disease. Next slide, please. So about 3,500 people in Ontario and 6,500 people across Canada have sickle cell disease. These numbers are expected to increase with immigration from countries with high disease prevalence, with new births in Canada from parents who carry the sickle cell disease trait and given improved care and treatment options, which result in increased life expectancy. Next slide. In Ontario and across Canada, sickle cell disease mostly affects racialized people, particularly those who identify as black. 
These people often experience racism and anti-Black racism in their interactions with the healthcare system, which negatively impacts the quality of the healthcare provided to them. Next slide, please. Living under stressful social and economic conditions can impact the overall health and well-being of people with sickle cell disease. Such stresses include social stigma, discrimination, and inadequate access to education, employment, income, and housing. A review of Ontario data from 2007 to 2017 showed that about 40% of patients lived in neighborhoods with the lowest income. Next slide, please. The sickle cell disease quality standard is one of Ontario Health's deliverables on the Black Health Plan which is the first provincial plan dedicated to advancing Black health. It was developed and stewarded by a diverse group of community members, health leaders, and academics. The plan seeks to build a health system that delivers sustained health equity for Black populations and furthers the goals of Ontario Health's equity, inclusion, diversity, and anti-racism framework. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, we'll move into uh, further details of the quality statements. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this particular quality standard addresses care for children, young people, and adults with sickle cell disease. And where appropriate, it also addresses the needs of families and caregivers or other substitute decision makers. The scope of this quality standard in includes uh, screening for and prevention of complications, the assessment and management of acute and chronic complications, and the use of disease-modifying therapies. It applies to all pediatric and adult healthcare settings, which includes hospitals, emergency departments, urgent care clinics, and primary care, specialist care, and home and community care settings. Next slide, please. So um, here you'll see a listing of the eight quality statement topics. Um, and uh, these have all been prioritized as key areas for improving care in Ontario. Today, for our topic today, uh, we're going to be highlighting quality statement number one and number seven. And uh, we'll bring up the next slide and I'm going to hand things over to Karen. Thank you. So I'm going to go over quality statement one, which, you know, we were happy to really start off with a clear statement, racism and anti-Black racism. Um, and so I'll read the statement out to you guys. People with sickle cell disease and their families and caregivers experience care from healthcare providers within a healthcare system that is free from racism and anti-Black racism, discrimination and stigma. Healthcare providers promote a culture that is compassionate, trauma-informed, and respectful of people's racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds. They build trust with people with sickle cell disease and their families and caregivers, work to remove barriers to accessing care, and provide care equitably. Oh, sorry, I'm hitting next slide, uh, well, but thank you very much for going to next slide. Um, and so we have an example of an action plan here if we were looking at one of the quality statements and just showing the template, how you really could utilize it. Uh, you really could take things that are right here and replicate what's already here, or you could tailor it more to your own setting. So our first column is what are gaps between current practice and the quality statement? One example, people with sickle cell refrain from or delay seeking care because of the stigma and discrimination they experience. Um, and so we have seen this quite um, heavily in the literature, whether it's the eMERGE that they delay going to or just going to their own providers. One of the barriers to this is the lack of healthcare provider knowledge around sickle cell and with respect to implementing the actual quality statement is lack of healthcare provider knowledge about sickle cell. And some opportunities or interventions to address this barrier at the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario, we've been able to launch an e-learning program, which we'll talk about a bit more as we continue. And then your organizational policies and procedures could be another example. The second example, people with sickle cell disease experience barriers to accessing care, including racism and anti-Black racism, and being labeled as drug seekers or drug seeking, either or. What are some barriers? So negative attitudes towards people with sickle cell, 
perceived maltreatment or marginalization in the clinical setting. Difficulty communicating with providers. Working towards social, social change in institutional environments and a pervasive discriminatory attitude in society. Again, some um, resources, anti-Black racism e-learning module, which we will highlight later in the presentation, centering Black youth well-being, a certificate on combating anti-Black racism, and then from Youth Rx, and then leveraging organizational policies. Uh, UHN is, is proud to have an anti-Black racism, um, an anti-Black racism and anti-racism policy in place that you can access. And we are also super proud of our Red Blood Cell Disorder Hub um, that has been launched. So these are the various resources you could use. Next slide, please. And so I'll move into the sickle cell disease education program for healthcare providers. Um, I'm super proud to be uh, one of the members of the team who did help lead the um, implementation of this program. Next slide, please. So this program itself, uh, you know, if I can talk a bit about why this program came to be, uh, we've seen certainly um, in the literature and, and through various presenters ahead of me, that lack of provider knowledge being one of the biggest barriers or gaps in care. Our patients are saying the same thing and healthcare providers are saying the same thing. And so we wanted to start building a program that was tailored towards healthcare providers. And the modules themselves are really based off of micro-credentialing. So modules are really meant to be about 10 minutes in length. Uh, and so each module is made up of a number of lessons. And I'm sorry, I, I'm using the language wrong. Each lesson is less than 10 minutes. And so for this particular one that you see on the screen, um, this is our pathophysiology of pain and pain assessments. This one's actually coming out in the next uh, week or two. And so you can see it's made up of two lessons. And so one thing we really want to encourage, and you can, the QR code is there, the link is there. We've so far created three modules. There will be 13 in total covering the whole spectrum of sickle cell. But the first ones that are out really talk about what is sickle cell in a bite-sized manner where you can just get a really good understanding and appreciation, not only of the disease, but of the barriers that patients face as well. Thank you. Next slide, please. So anti-Black racism e-learning module from Tazin is also available and will give you an introduction to anti-Black racism. Um, obviously, it's a module available to anyone, and so it also supports um, anti-Black racism in particular. And so we just want to say that the difference between the two modules is that the Scago one really does pull in that sickle cell piece, so really being able to look at anti-Black racism with the lens of sickle cell. Thank you. Next slide, and I'll hand it over to Sindhu. Um, so another resource um, that's great to increase your knowledge on anti-Black racism is Youth Research and Evaluation Exchanges um, Online Certificate Centering Black Youth Wellbeing. Um, so this certificate, it provides Ontario's youth sector with foundational knowledge to cultivate practices, policies, and alliances that challenge, disrupt, and combat systemic anti-Black racism. And while it is uh, for the youth serving sector, it's very applicable to any um, social human services, including healthcare. Um, and this certificate is working towards a vision that will support structural transformation in Ontario's youth sector that centers on the well-being of Black young people, as well as their families, um, and also in our institutional policies and organizations. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background, the certificate. It includes 17 lectures um, as well as two artistic performances organized around four modules. Next slide, please. So um, another resource I wanted to discuss is uh, looking at your internal resources. Um, so in healthcare, um, it is very hierarchical and bureaucratic, and these institutions unfortunately do mirror white supremacy. So it's really important to leverage what exists. And at UHN, we're very um, proud, as uh, Karen said, to be like one of the only hospitals in the universe with an anti-racism, anti-Black racism policy. So um, I find it helpful to really um, frame a lot of our equity initiatives within this policy so that it's captured within the organizational um, operations. Um, so this policy is very uh, strong because it names um, the inequality, it names anti-Black racism, it specifies organizational processes as well as 
as internal and external resources. Um, and um, it specifies also UHN's commitment to dismantling institutional racism in care, employment, education, and research. And this is all connected to patient care as well. Next slide. Um, so this is one initiative um, that the RBCD clinic at UHN has um, developed, and this is the RBCD hub. So that's a website. Um, and, you know, basically um, it's um, an initiative with patients, um, the interdisciplinary team, and it basically it's aimed at, you know, shifting the cultural and social like oppressive attitudes, the racism, anti-black racism that exists through media. Um, and, you know, it's like challenging kind of the discourse in society. Um, so, you know, you can have a look later on, but there's our website and our goal is to really uh, deliver meaningful stories within a, within a social justice framework. Work. Next slide. So these are just a snapshot of some of the stories that are um, already posted. So, you know, it looks at, you know, capitalism and how that constrains uh, people with sickle cell disease. There's stories um, about, you know, a patient's experience of waiting inside the patient's waiting room. And then there's also educational resources as well. So we have an article um, that really uh, outlines uh, how racism is organized into medicine and specifically sickle cell disease. And then we also have um, an article um, about patient relations and how people with sickle cell disease can uh, leverage that support. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to review um, the next quality statement, which is psychosocial assessment, information, and support. Um, so this statement reads, people with sickle cell disease and their families and caregivers have regular psychosocial assessments to identify any psychosocial needs or barriers to accessing care. Those with unmet psychosocial needs are offered information and support to address these needs. So in the next few slides, we're gonna talk about some examples that really look at psychosocial support in terms of mental health and community support, but also physician's role in um, psychosocial assessment, information and support. Next slide. So I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Lanre. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sintu. Um, I just wanted to also advise that uh, some of the examples from Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario's perspective is that we provide counseling support uh, to individuals living with sickle cell disease and their family. And also we support um, respite, emergency and transportation needs of our folks. Um, this was very evident during the COVID-19 pandemic when people felt like they were isolated, there was need for food support, um, devices to connect with other people, counseling was so much needed, social worker need um, was very high. We were able to do that. So if your establishment or um, you know, you know, or you are aware of patients that need this support, they, the website information is there. You can uh, definitely refer them to these resources. Thank you. Next slide. I would also like to share uh, an example of what I call a psychosocial model of care. So this is in partnership with the Black Creek Community Center and the Ontario Health. So the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario um, uh, um, went into partnership, right, to be able to support the many individuals in her community that truly need psychosocial support. And over a seven month period, we were able to provide um, about 328 individuals in the Jane and Finch area, which is a catchment for the Black Creek Community Health Center with individualized information and counseling support um, when it comes to sickle cell disease. We were also able to provide about 94 individuals with respite academic and counseling support. So um, this is very important that we were able to also apply the Ontario Health sickle cell disease quality standards um, to the development of the care model. And through this, we realize that people in this catchment are able to have an improved understanding of the disease, how they can manage their disease, and also what help and what resources are available uh, to them. Um, next slide. Yes, there is also another example of 
uh, our, our psychosocial support model. And this time, this is in collaboration with an hospital and not a community health center. Um, in addition to the services offered under the community health center and Chicago model of psychosocial care, with the London Health Science Center, we also added a care support program, right? Whereby we have a dedicated patient well-being coordinator who will be a member of the healthcare team. And the role of this person will be number one to notify, uh, to, sorry, this person will be notified if a patient with sickle cell disease shows up in the emergency department and or, and or if they are in, in, you know, in the hospital being admitted. And so as the patient well-being coordinator, they will then support care of this individual where they are in hospital and they will follow them when they are also discharged from the hospital. They will ensure that the hospital staff um, adhere to protocols, guidelines, and quality standards. And their role is also to support and empower patients to report and also address suboptimal care. For the London program, which is a pilot program, um, and we're hoping that this program will commence in summer of 2023. This is funded by the Ministry of Health. Um, we are hoping that this role for the London area will cover Sanair, Woodstock, Windsor, and other neighboring areas. We are also going to be starting a similar program for the GTA um, to cover the Greater Toronto area in collaboration with North York General Hospital as well. Next slide. So um, I also wanted to talk about um, an initiative that the RBCD clinic is doing, and I think it's applicable for all physicians and other medical practitioners, and that is supporting workplace accommodations. Um, so employment and income, as we know, are key social determinants of health. Um, but a lot of people with sickle cell disease, they face barriers because um, sickle cell disease is often not thought of as a disability. And so that means that people don't get their accommodations um, and they don't get like entitlements that would be helpful. So accommodations, including time off to, you know, uh, attend medical appointments, tend to unexpected illnesses, remote work, work um, flexible start times, and so forth, right? So um, the Human Rights Code, it does obligate um, employers to um, accommodate people with sickle cell disease. So that could, you know, enable their participation. However, um, you know, it challenges the human rights code in the same vein. It relies on medical documentation. So employers can request this, right? So this is an opportunity for physician collaboration and advocacy to address the social determinants of health. And so in the RBCD clinic, we're developing a tool to kind of move beyond the medical model to see the, you know, leverage the interprofessional team to see the patient in the environment and, um, you know, develop a, a letter of accommodation that's discreet but communicates you know that the the, the person has a disability uh, what are their limitations and how they can do the work with the appropriate accommodations and then we're also working to embed um, a disability rights education uh, resource so that's also in development and the goal is to really embed this into routine practice and I think you know physicians in primary care nurse practitioners in primary care settings they can also you know work off this to support uh, people sickle cell disease um, and any other like chronic illness and disability. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to share some resources um, that you can use. So Ontario Human Rights Commission policy position on medical documentation. So it outlines doctors' roles um, and it it clarifies what information is required in the accommodation process. So that's really important. So you're not disclosing too much information, right? Um, the second resource is the Job Accommodation Network page on sickle cell disease. So this is a great resource because it gives people language to describe what their limitations are and accommodation ideas. So I share this with patients, but also it would be great for physicians, uh, nurse practitioners also to be a little bit fluent on how to make that request. Um, the second resource, it is a UK-based uh, guide on workplace accommodations. So again, it 
gives you ideas on how to describe the disability, the limitation and accommodation ideas. And it's really great because uh, Canada, we have very similar social policies and values as the UK. So it's, it's I find it very like similar to use. And then finally, the resource um, I have at the bottom is Arch Disability Law. They provide free legal consultation for people with disabilities in Ontario. So it's funded by Legal Aid Ontario and it's a specialty clinic. So that could be a resource if you know a patient is unsure about their rights, um, they could be referred to that uh, resource to, to really understand what their rights are, what the process is, and so forth. Next slide. Great. Thanks so much, Sindhu. And um, next, I'd like to highlight a couple of additional tools and resources to support implementation of the sickle cell disease quality standard. Next slide. Um, so while we were developing the quality standard, Ontario Health has developed an online e-report for sickle cell disease that is now available for hospitals in Ontario and regions. So with a one ID login, you can access select indicators related to sickle cell disease that can help enable quality improvement efforts. The report is dynamic and you can view data at the hospital and regional level. For more information, uh, you can go to the, our quality standard sickle cell disease website and then scroll down to the e-report. We'll also put the link in, in the chat box today. And this report, you can look at your hospital or region compared to other, region, other hospitals or regions um, on a number of sickle cell disease indicators. Next slide, please. And finally, the Sickle Cell Disease Quality Standard has a, a clinical placemat. Uh, this is a quick reference guide for clinicians that summarizes the quality standard and includes links to many of the helpful resources and tools that were summarized today. And we have put that all into a two page summary as a quick reference guide that is directly aligned with the quality standard. Next slide, please. Um, so that that's the end of our formal um, presentation, and uh, we're happy to open it up to questions and answers. Thank you so much to the whole team. Um, what a great fulsome presentation. Um, I have a couple of notes myself, but I do note that there is one question in the chat already, which we will get to. I want to let people know that they are welcome to raise their virtual hand or they are welcome to put their question in the chat and I will manage that with our team. I also want to let you know that there's been very many amazing resources shared today and what we will do for participants just to make it easier is we will collate all of those for you at our end and we would we will send them out to you as one document um, so that you have them all in one place because I know there's been a lot and we don't want to lose track of them because they're, they're very useful. Um, so there is um, a question from Mani, I hope I'm saying that correctly, about who they should contact with, uh, connect with about the LHSC sickle cell psychosocial program. So I will go um, on that question. So thank you, Money, for uh, asking that question. So if you want more information on that, you can reach out to myself. I'll put my information in the chat box. Uh, it's Lynn Ray, and um, my email address will also be in the chat box, which is Sickle Cell Awareness Ontario at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I will welcome any other folks to raise their virtual hand or put a question in the chat. Um, and perhaps while people have a moment just to think about what their questions might be, um, I just wanted to um, really congratulate the team on this work. I mean, this is an immense amount of work involving a number of, of people. Um, and I wanted to just um, point out that the foundational pieces in your quality statement, number one, around systemic anti-Black racism and trauma-informed care are so central. And I think that it's worth uh, reminding folks on the call that racism is trauma. And so when people are talking about trauma informed care, it's really important that we recognize and remember racism as trauma. Um, so I, I really appreciate that that was the foundational quality st statement number one. 
Um, I also wanted to let folks know, um, and I think this uh, again relates to your presentation, particularly your part Sinthu around policy, um, that for those who haven't seen the draft CPSO health and human rights policy, we have now explicitly embedded anti-racism, anti-oppression, cultural safety and cultural humility as professional obligations which physicians must meet. And so I think it comes back to what you were saying, Lanry, at the very beginning, that this is actually our duty as healthcare professionals. It's our duty as physicians to provide anti-racist, culturally safe care, because when we don't do that, as you have so eloquently and powerfully outlined in your presentation, people come to harm and they come to real and tangible harm. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm going to go to a question in the chat. Um, I think there's a couple actually. So I'm going to go first of all to Cheryl, um, who's asking um, of the 3,500 and 6,500 people with SCD, does that include people with SC type or only SS? I don't know, Madeline, if you want to take that or who would like to take that one? Yeah, I believe those are stats that were compiled compiled through efforts led by SCAGO. Um, and uh, from I wasn't directly involved, but from my understanding, that includes all genotypes. So that would be hemoglobin SS, SC, S beta thalassemia, other more rare compound heterozygous forms such as S, D, or E. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything there, Lanry. Um, I totally agree with you. So that includes all individuals with sickle cell disease. And yeah, so thank you for that. I just saw something in the chat. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah. Um, somebody's asking if they can wear a bracelet. We do have bracelets for sickle cell. And if anyone is interested, if they email me with their address, we can ship the bracelet to them that they can use and give to their patient as well. Thank you. What a great idea. So, you folks have yeah. thought of everything. <laughs> Go ahead, Karen. No, I was going to add on to because um, Narinder seems to be to me, she's talking more of like, a you know, an alert one for the patient. And mm -hmm. so what I have found sometimes is it goes back to that stigma piece, you know, would wearing a bracelet with, with the disease identified help if the patient has to go to emerge? It might. Um, if the provider's willing a, to look for it, it, you know, actually determine what actions they should take. But also some patients don't like wearing it because it just it, lab it puts a label. Um, so there is some stigma about that too. There's there's quite a bit of stigma in sickle cells. So um, that would be my response. I'm sorry that I jumped. The CF1 is good too, but I had uh, just because Ms. Lenry went to this one. No, that's great, Karen. Thank you for that reminder. And I imagine that for, and and maybe this is true, maybe it isn't, but I'm thinking about younger, young people with sickle cell as well and, and the stigma around that for them particularly. Um, would you like to address the CF um, question? Because I think it's an excellent question, uh, Karen or anyone else. Um, I, can, I can start and Karen, maybe you can jump in. So I wanted to say that in, in, in Canada, about 4,800 people have cystic fibrosis and about 6,500 have sickle cell disease. Um, so I agree with Ranjit that this is uh, an, an example of disparity in how we are allocating resources and so on and so forth. And if you look at those who are affected by sickle cell disease, as Dr. Madeline alluded to, were people of Black African origin and people with CF are predominantly Caucasian. So again, you're looking at the difference in the racial, um, you know, background of those who are affected. Now, we are not saying that. CF should not be funded or have money and stuff like that. But what we are saying is that there should be an equitable um, approach to sickle cell as well, whereby we should also have a similar level of funding, research, and so on into sickle cell, similar to disorders like cystic fibrosis. So uh, I think that is what we're thinking also with this policy standard that has been developed, there will be a more awareness around these disparities and what needs to be done to also improve the health outcomes for individuals with sickle cell disease. So Karen, I don't know if you want to add anything more to that. Thank you. Thank you. You did an awesome job. I was only going to um, add a piece around 
the question being asked, you know, how do we address the disparities in resource allocation? You know, one one thing I think about is who's sitting at the tables. I think, you know, who is actually adding to the conversation, who's leading the conversation, and is are our voices at the table? So we need to get to the table. So actually being able to have opportunities to sit at research funding tables, you know, or to be able to really leverage the opportunity to have more sickle cell research um, uh, funding available so that we are then able to get those resources that we need. I also want to say, I think Jennifer had done, um, uh, sorry, Dr. Brian had um, done a study too around the pain, right? You know, pain assessments and and treatment between CF and sickle cell. So a very, like, you'll see quite a difference there. It was CF, wasn't it? it? Or maybe, but there was a second, I didn't know if Ms. Lannery was, but there's a, that just that idea that there's other diseases that have very similar presentations, very similar, you know, need for complex care, but the resource differences are vast. Yeah, and um, Dr. Brian actually did a webinar for us, as you may know, Karen, where she talked about that data. Um, I'm not sure if it was a direct comparison to CF, but certainly she looked at time from uh, arrival to the ER to time of analgesia, which I think you touched on, Lamri, in those very powerful stories that you shared. Um, and certainly, you know, assumptions about drug seeking behavior and not just that, but assumptions about how somebody should appear when they are in pain. And I think as physicians, we have a very fixed idea about what a patient in pain looks like. And what was really important, I think, about Dr. Bryan's presentation and hearing in her presentation from her colleague who has lived experience of sickle cell is that when you are dealing with pain on a chronic basis, the way you then manage that pain, you know, it, it may not manifest in the sort of traditional way that we think about the patient being in pain. And that was a really important point that we got from uh, from Dr. Bryan and her colleague. Um, I want to go to Dr. Downey's uh a question, Bernice Downey's question, which I think you've touched upon all of you in your presentation, but perhaps you can expand uh, upon this. I know certainly the CPSO's efforts and how do we, you know, really get uh, folks to be thinking about this are having conversations like this, are having folks come out. We've done some podcasts, we've done some other articles, but do, does anybody want to talk about kind of what is happening in medical education at the medical school, at the nursing school, et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. I can start and then someone else can jump in for sure. Um, I can speak to nursing schools first sim simply because I'm a nurse. Uh, so I know for sure in nursing school there's not much conversation at all about sickle cell. There's some schools that are including you know, some intro to it, but nurses are coming out of their programs not actually being presented with or sorry being equipped with the skills and knowledge around sickle cell disease. Um, and so it, through the work through SCOGO and educating, health, educating healthcare providers, it's this piecemeal, like any uh, kind of connection I know in a university, I speak to them and, and speak my story and say, like, how can we not include this for nursing students? And so, yes, you know, I've, I'm into U of T, Humber's next on the line and U of Ottawa is, is following closely behind. But then when I look at the medical side of things, I, you know, I do from my perspective and um, please, Dr. Verhoeven, Ver you can jump in. But my impression is that there's, you get exposed to sickle cell, but it's not, it's still not enough for I think those situations really where you might be in emerge, you, you come to emerge and you're in that hospital for like a week, you've not been presented ever with a sickle cell patient. So what you may have learned in school is not fresh, you know, in that moment. So what I feel we really need is that in the moment opportunity for education, which to the sickle cell education program has been built in that manner. So what the question, you know, where was it? Is it recommend? No. Uh, oh, it's popped up. The question was um, around medical educator responsibility. I think it would be wonderful if all the doctors in this, you know, in this webinar take, picks up the sickle cell disease education program and says, okay, this is where we're going to start. We're going to start with educating ourselves right from the top. What is sickle cell disease and ensuring that it's made mandatory, ensuring that people, you know, and mandatory was a hard thing, but I would just say um, action. Right. What is the action that you are going to do? You are clear. We all know that the uh, education is needed. What action are you going to take from this webinar to help move that forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm happy to try to build on that, Karen. Um, there, there's so many layers to the education that individuals in training at all the levels of training would need to have exposure to sickle cell. So it's ensuring that there are those standards at the level. So speaking specifically to medical education for physicians at the level of the medical school and that it's 
woven into the accreditation standards and the learning expectations for all medical schools. And then taking it from there, I think to your point, Karen, it's making sure that there's some basic foundational knowledge, which by its nature would be more book knowledge or, or didactic kind of learning, and then trying to figure out ways for applied learning for what in some parts of the country, as we've acknowledged and in some parts of Ontario, may be considered a rare, rarer disease or a rare presentation. So how do you weave in that experiential case-based learning so that a learner, when they're first meeting an actual real life patient, they're not having to kind of dig back into the cobwebs of book learning and they're kind of ready to apply that knowledge. So I think the learning materials that Karen and the team have developed are so important. Trying to think of ways to enhance case-based learning. And I think it's, um, it's the medical expert knowledge, but as we keep on coming back to here, it's, it's, it's that those core attitudes of uh, patient-centered, anti-racist, anti-oppressive, trauma-informed care that you don't need to know everything about sickle cell in order to connect with that human being in front of you who's suffering. And then it's kind of applying on the medical knowledge as well. So Bernice, your question is, is so um, excellent. And uh, I've thought about it a lot over the years of my career focused in on sickle cell and other red cell disorders. And I've tried as, a, as an individual person to, to try to you know, give talks here and there to different audiences. I'll acknowledge though as well um, that because sickle cell, it, the complications can be so multi-system, it ends up in fact needing to be something that even once uh, medical residents are doing their training in the various specialties, obstetrics and gynecology needs to know about it, anesthesia needs to know about it, critical care, the surgical specialties, um, so it, it can't just be, you know, the hematologists trying to, uh, give individual talks. It does become ensuring that it's woven into and recognizing that there's only so many hours of learning that trainees do only so many years in their programs. So how do we ensure a minimum standard, uh, a minimal amount of content that's going to make, uh, people, you know, as we think of competitive competency-based medical education, what are those competencies? I think what you said was so well said, Madeline, in terms of, um, you know, really the book pieces of it, and I'm thinking as an anesthesiologist, right, what I learned about sickle cell disease, and, and you know, I remember most of those sort of book pieces and textbook pieces, but, and I could go and look that up, but what is central and what isn't taught is what you were speaking about, which is what are the fundamental uh, principles of anti-racist, anti-oppressive, trauma-informed care that really make a huge difference, not just to that patient's experience, but ultimately to their outcome, you know, from a very kind of, you know, medical objective kind of standpoint in terms of outcomes. So so thank you for that. Um, and then there's two more questions in the chat um, from Ranjit and from uh, Marnie. So I, anybody can take those. Um, if you can't see them, let me know, but I think you can all see the chat. Um, I I can talk about the accountability, and I think maybe Carol can also maybe uh, pitch in this one. So with the quality standard, we've been working with the Ministry of Health and, and also Ontario Health to make sure that healthcare providers are held accountable, um, you know, for ensuring that they provide the right care at the right time to uh, um, Ontario patients. Um, and so I don't know if Carol wants to pitch in on the accountability piece. Thank you. Yeah, we're Can definitely. I, no, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Carol. No, no, you go ahead, Madeline. Well, I just I, the flavor I took from Dr. Downey's question there was more. I mean, I guess one could also view that as, you know, as we look at these metrics that we've put out with the quality standards, what does accountability look like for the institutions? And and currently, it's not set up in such a way that meeting a certain standard is mandatory or is incentivized in any way for the, the health institution. So I think Dr. Downey's bringing up a really good point 
that we have continued to bring up in the course of our deliberations and work as a quality standards uh, committee. Um, again, not to put you on the spot there, Carol, but I think that that is a question that we're all still feeling um, at, you know, as a sickle cell uh, community that we would really love to see something more uh, where, where that, you know, with that scorecard. Yeah. And, and that's, that's part of the planning that we're doing right now around implementation of the quality standards. So we've completed the development, we've released it, and now we're, we're working with um, our, the IDAR team at Ontario Health to then go out to the regions, um, the EDI t um, regional teams to work on implementation of the quality standard and build accountability uh, agreements into implementing the quality standard within the region. So that, that's part of the work that we have ahead. We've completed the development and we're working on planning for implementation now. And that will address accountability and uh, the responsibilities within the regions to, um, to uh, implement the standards. Thank you, Carol, for that. Um, and I think what you said earlier, Madeline, about you know how do we tie this to things like accreditation? How do we tie this to things like CPSO policy around um, what constitutes you know professional misconduct, et cetera, et cetera? So it's sort of this multi-pronged uh, you know thing that we all have to be involved in as multiple stakeholders and organisations in order to get to the outcomes that we that we want to see. Um, I think Marnie's question was answered, and we just have about three more minutes. So I just want to go to Ranjit's question about clinical algorithms for sickle cell disease. Um, I'm not sure if anybody wants to take that one. So the only thing honest I, that comes to mind for me, and I'm hoping um, Dr. Forsyth jumps in with something else, uh, the, is the EGFR. I, I, I think about that a bit, um, that being a race-based, uh, you know, uh, value for kidney function, and that that really puts sickle cell patients at quite a uh, disparity around getting early referral for kidney transplant or dialysis. Uh, our death rate is high when it comes to end-stage renal disease in comparison to the rest of the population. Six is something like 6% for the rest of the population on any ESRD and 46% for sickle cell. So it's because it's taking too long to actually capture that the patient needs help because this additional value has been added. So 2021, that value was supposed to be removed, but my sense is that not all, orga all organizations have uptaken that, 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 that not, we're not all not using it, the additional value. So that's mm -hmm. the one thing I can think of. Mm -hmm. And I'll add on, I think the two other things that spring to mind are uh, bias in reporting of pulmonary function tests. And, you know, this historical notion that somehow the uh, breathing capacities of people who are Black are, are meant to be different than anybody else. And so that's being challenged and that needs to be addressed in terms of reporting so that we're not under-reporting issues related to, um, uh, you know, breathing and flow rates. And then, um, uh, oh dear, it just slipped out of my mind. Yeah, so we are, I think overall, there's been a reckoning uh, about these kind of, oh, the other one is the neutrophil counts. So that overall, the, the what's considered not reported out as normal range uh, for neutrophil counts is different, uh, actually, depending on geography. So this is a little bit different and recognize, um, making sure that we're not under treating people with hydroxyurea as a result of what's actually a normal neutrophil count for them. So uh, being considering uh, ra racial variability in both directions and making sure that it is not resulting in uh, under treatment or under diagnosis. Thank you, Madeline. We are at time. Thank you, Karen, for addressing Alex's question. And I do believe, Alex, that I have seen recently um, something around this from the Canadian Pediatric Society. I know one of my colleagues and Madeline's colleague, uh, uh, our colleague, Cassia Johnson, um, was involved in some of those pain standards specifically with um, lens to anti-Black racism. Um, but I wanna kind of just thank our presenters really wholeheartedly. This has been exceedingly helpful. And uh, just to underscore what you're saying about, can everybody on this webinar today go away and take one action, however small it may seem. I think we all you know, have a, a responsibility to transform our systems and our institutions. And you've given us so many great resources and opportunities to think about how we might do that. So thank you so much for your time. As I said, we will collate all these resources for you. 
uh, and send them to all of the participants. Um, and I just want to thank our presenters once again and thank everybody who joined the call for uh, joining in in your lunch hour. This is recorded and will be posted along with our other recorded webinars. So if you had any technical difficulties or if you want to pass this recording on to others, please know that it will be available. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.